This is the Small Town Big Talk Show, the only place where you can listen in on real life conversations about the challenges and the joys of living in a small town. I'm your host, Rebecca Undam, and each week a guest will join me as we tackle one topic that more than likely we're all feeling or have thought about, but of course, no one wants to talk about. Let's chat. My guest on today's episode is Marlene Ike. She is a speaker and a coach for millennial leaders, especially women that are connected to agriculture. Uh, Marlene is also the host of a really great, really great podcast called Live Your Story. And uh, we got connected through the internet. Um, It's one of the beautiful things about the world that we live in. And that's actually a little bit about what we talked about in today's episode. We talked specifically about how to build relationships when you are in a small town, not just with the people that are geographically close to you, but with people that are far away as well. Uh, It is a seriously beautiful conversation. So have a listen. And of course, let us know what you think. Happy listening. I'm so stinking excited to be sitting, actually looking at your face. I, uh, we yeah, had I'm, such I'm so great, glad we're doing this. Me too. We had such a great conversation on your podcast mm-hmm. um, just not even a month ago now. No, it wasn't very long ago. Yeah. And I, um, I hope that you choose to be a high flyer, like a regular repeat, repeat guest, because I just think we oh, have so many, so many fun things that we can talk about. So today... Um, and you and I were kind of jamming a little bit before we, um, hit record here, but talking about, we're going to talk about relationships basically and how, so, and this is beautiful timing when you brought this up to me. Um, my VA and I just talked about this yesterday about how tricky it can be to network. So I'm putting air quotes around that. Mm -hmm. Um, Networking when you're in a large city has a very different context and I think meaning if especially if you're a an entrepreneur you have a business that you're trying to build and promote um networking looks very different in a large city compared to what it looks like in a small town and you have some thoughts about this and I cannot wait to talk about it because it's really (laughs) really important it's the isolation it's all the things that we talk about but especially in this context of building the right connections and how you know right so yeah, I mean, you mentioned that networking has this, it has a very specific connotation if you live in a larger population area, and I think it has a very professional connotation, and there's nothing wrong with that, but like we have a certain kind of um, setting, we might, we might even think of a certain kind of like environment or setting in which to do what networking, like, oh, you're going to go to an event to do networking, or or you mean like, oh, I'm going to make sure I show up early for the before meeting reception in order to chat with people, or I'm just going to very pointedly like have lunches with people in order to make professional connections. And so kind of has that connotation. And in small towns, it's a lot of the same um, approaches. It's a lot of the same um, things that matter, but it looks different because Mm -hmm. in a city or in any larger area, you're professionally networking, and then you only have relationships with that people in the professional sphere. And in a small town, like there's buckets, right? And in a small town, your connections in a small town um, exist in your professional life and your personal life, and probably your family life and your school, your kids like school life. (laughs) And and it's it's very... um, it's very, I was going to say muddy, but that makes it sound like it's negative. But it's just like, it, there's no like clear distinction. And so networking, I think, just feels different in a small, um, in a smaller area than it does in a big town. So yeah, I'm excited to talk about all this. Oh, okay. So that's beautiful, Marlene. What you just said, I actually do use the word messy quite okay. often <laughs> to, describe, to describe this because I get that it, it has a negative connotation, but what to me it says is that it's a challenge. Because it is, it's a challenge. And so all of the relationships that I have, like you said, it's, we're inextricably linked, right? Like you can't, there's no compartmentalizing (laughs) relationships in small towns. There's just not, you're going to see that professional connection in the grocery store. And then you're going to see them standing in the post office. And then your kids might, and then then you're going to see them at church right? and probably in eight different places in your life. Um, right. so, but, but I also think that that sort of, um, the messiness of it sometimes is what 
will make us hesitate about making new connections. Right. Because we think, oh, we don't have to be intentional about it. Or uh, we think if we've moved into a town, like, well, these people all just have their connections already. And so it is messy. And so I think there's a lot of cool opportunities, but perhaps some challenges that are not valid, but we let them be challenges because of it too. Right, right. Yeah. Absolutely. So those are always, it's always the idea of limiting beliefs, right? That it's the, yeah. the way that we think about these things that actually create the problem. It's not a problem in and of itself. Yeah. Um, so I do think that's true that um, t- two things, one of the things that sparked in my mind when you said that, like it might keep us from, might make us hesitate to reach out to new people. I also think we tend um, because of this close proximity to prejudge the value of, of the relationship. So we have a, a, in our mindset, like, well, this is that person in that context. Therefore, what can they add to this other part of my life? And do you, do you feel like that's true? Oh my gosh. Okay. So, um, before I answer that, can I, can I provide a little background context? Because please I, do. Have, I even had some notes I wanted to share. Yep. Please so, do. I we're going to come back to that. Um, so I, I grew up in a small town, like my, the town that I actually grew up near as a population of 200, like that was my mom and dad's address. So a town of 200, no stoplight. So it was a little town that had a grain elevator and the church that I, you know, went to. So the town of 200, a church. Did you have a bar? Was that? No. By the time that I was a kid, no. When I was, when my parents were growing up, there were two bars in town. Okay. That's that's normal. You know, it's like a church and at least a bar. (laughs) That's right. But um, the bars had closed. There was a little grocery store. I think even when I was a baby, there was maybe still a tiny grocery store. Um, But you know, like the next small town is only four miles away because this is Ohio. Towns are very close together. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the next small town still has the little grocery store and, you know, the couple bars and the other town in the other way does. So again, a town of 200, real small. Um, but, you know, we were 20 minutes away from the bigger town of 30,000 people. So, you know, not too far, but like I really associated my identity with that little town. And so growing up, you know, I watched the way my parents had connections with people, right? So they had connections. They had both grown up in that community, especially my dad. Here's, here's some good, like, here's some good info. I've been doing some family history research and I'll just tell you about my dad's family specifically. So my dad's family has always lived in, the, in, in my hometown and all of my dad's ancestors are from Germany. I'm a, I'm a, a good German American, like, you know, descendant and Lutheran because yeah. of that as well. And, um, all all of my dad's ancestors are buried in one of two cemeteries right outside Janeiro, Ohio. They all, anybody that moved from Germany and came to America, like came directly to Janeiro and they are buried there. So like none of my dad's ancestors are German and like came and lived in Pennsylvania and then their kids like later lived in Indiana and then came, no. All of my dad's ancestors um, always lived in Janeiro and had come to Janeiro directly from Germany. So, you know, not good or bad, but I'm, I'm like a very stereotypical small town kid where like you're related to everyone, right? Your entire family has always lived there. Mm -hmm. And so my mom's story would be similar, but not quite, not quite as intense. Um, And so, you know, as I watched my parents have connections with people growing up, they were very close with a lot of people because they went to church with those people. You know, it was a big church in a small community. But also my dad is cousins with like 40 people, I think, you know, like half the county or half the township in the area. Yeah. And so um, my parents are farmers, so they didn't necessarily have like these, these professional jobs that were like off the farm. Sure. So I'd never watched them necessarily network or connect with people that way. But mostly like they were there and they still are people who are very involved and very uh, connected in this very close knit community with people, you know, so they're the kind of people who, oh, so-and-so just had a baby. We're going to take them a meal. So-and-so needs their driveway plowed out with the snow. Like, I'm just going to stop down and do that. Um, but as a kid, I always witnessed that because, oh, well, they're family or they're part of the church family or like whatever. And so like that just thought made sense. So I say all that to say, by the time that I became an adult, I felt like I don't know how to meet people or connect to people. Like, unless, <laughs> unless they're like, my second cousin, or I go to church with them, or they're like in this thing that I'm really already a part of. 
um, just because like I, no one had taught me to do that. I, I don't think intentionally. And so when I married my husband, I moved to his hometown. And so the town that we kind of live near is a town of about 25, 30,000 people. So it's a nice, like big town um, and has a lot of really neat stuff in it. And, but I was sort of like, okay, like, hmm, how do, like, how do I, how do I do this? Um, and we lived for a little while, kind of in a small town that neither of us were from, but in Ohio. So anyway, as an adult, I feel like, okay, like you kind of have to like figure this out. So back to the question, which was about assuming other people can't fit into different things. Yep. I feel like one of the first things you have to get over if you want to make connections with people who are geographically very close to you in a small town is to not make assumptions about uh, a couple of things. One would be um, what they think about you. So I think I thought it was very tempting when I moved here to be like, oh, well, people like that's not somebody BJ was close with or whatever. So they're not going to want to they're not going to want to get to know me. Mm -hmm. Well, why am I why am I putting that on them? I don't know what they think about me or don't think about me or if they would want to be friends with me or not. Or, you know, I might have thought, oh, they're not going to care about hanging out with me because I'm just like the girl who moved in who doesn't know anything about here. Well, how do I, how do I know what they're thinking about me? I mean, so I think it's really tempting to put assumptions on other people about, well, they're, they're either, they already think this about me or they're not going to, like, it, as a way to say, they're not going to want to be connected to me, so I shouldn't reach out to them. Right. Rarely are those things true. Right. Rarely are those well, things true. And I think sometimes that temptation comes from very limited information that you've maybe been given about that person. Right. It's right. very, very limited. I, you know, it's funny in, in, in my yeah. book, I actually talk about <clears throat> um, moving back to my small town. Right. The couple that taught my husband and I Lamaze, okay, in my small town, so I'm pregnant with our first child, were Hannah's parents. Like they were, they right. were the parents of one of my classmates. And honestly, admittedly, Hannah and I were not close. Like we didn't just didn't run in the same social circles. I made the joke, That's like right. they were also Catholic, which, you know, so didn't go, we didn't run into them in church because we were Lutherans. Like, but yeah. it, it was so, that was one of the first times for me, like as an adult, I obviously, I, I moved to Fargo, biggest city in North Dakota. I learned how to network. Yeah. But in our, in this very traditional you're in a big city, you go to chambers, chamber events and business after hours and you right. do this exchanging of business cards, right? Like, so I learned how to do that. Right. That was my first experience being back here where I was so truly tickled, like delighted to my core at the gift that these two people brought into my life. And I I knew nothing about them as humans, right? I, they were just- Right, they were that's right. So I think the temptation, especially I would say if you're a returner, for sure, if you're coming back to a place where, you know, yeah. you, you have knowledge of people, but it's very limited. Right. Help, it's really easy to be like, oh, well. Oh, well, we didn't. Yeah. Or also like assuming <laughs> or assuming that the folks you went to high school with are the same people that they were when they were 17. Uh, they're not. Neither are you. Like. Right. Right. Let's all, let's all just get past the fact that we either did or didn't hang out in high school, right? Because, oh, we're not, high school is a whole other world, you know? Right, <laughs> right. And, For and sure. Yeah, so if someone um, sees you at the grocery store, smiles, but then turns around, it's not that they, oh, I, they don't want to meet you. It might be that they just realize their toddler is in the next aisle over and they need to go, you know, chase them down. And so I think those kind of things, we, we pick up, like you said, on little cues or this tiny bit of information that we have either from our past or from some kind of current interaction. And then we make a whole host of assumptions based on it and right. about why, oh, that person won't want to connect with me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we just need to really keep ourselves open um, about that. But I think one of the other assumptions we make is we make assumptions about who those people are. So going back to the like, we're not the same people. As, as we were in high school right. um, or making assumptions about who people are because, well, their parents and my parents aren't friends. And so we wouldn't be friends. Well, mm -hmm. but 
isn't logical at all, right? right. Um, um, so we make assumptions about who people are, or we go, oh, well, they've always been in that organization that I don't think I care for. But that doesn't say who they are as a total human, you know? So um, there's just so many ways, again, that we pick up on these little pieces of information and then make assumptions about stuff. And hey, I get it. That's how our brains work. That's how our brains work for survival, like in, in making yep. broad assumptions. It keeps but, us safe. <clears throat> yeah, but when we do that too much and don't safeguard ourselves against things that might not actually be true, we really limit ourselves from connecting with people who live geographically near us. So it keeps yeah. us small. Yes. It small. It keeps us small. Yes. And I, yeah. I such, such good things. I, so there's two things um, that kind of tie to, to your, to these two points. One of the things I try to do, and again, I'm very flawed. I'm a flawed human being, Marlene. And so I struggle with this, but I try to assume good intent. Yeah. You know, so like you said, yeah. when you're, when you're, when you see something, a visual cue, and usually that's, I think that's, that happens a lot where somebody, yeah. um, I, it's so funny. Cause you just want to say like, you act, we actually have no idea what's going on in their minds. That's right. making them, they might, they might've gotten terrible news. Like right. just before right. they're seeing you. So you just never know, but just to always assume that to assume good intent that, you know, they're yeah. not out to get you. And until they actually prove to you otherwise, right? Right. Right. That's when maybe some boundaries yeah. go up and all that kind of thing. Um, yeah. But I, the other thing I like to remind myself, and this again is, it's this opening up of my own, um, I guess I would say judgments. Like I, it made, made me aware of them, it like opened up my awareness of how poorly I do this. Um, but it's just to remind myself that I can learn something from every single person. And that I, just because they had this specific role, especially in my history, I would say, doesn't mean that there's not more to them than that. And right. there's right. so much to right. learn from people. And it's so right. cool when you discover like actually hidden talents in other people that you didn't, you had no idea they had. That's it's right. Because really, you only knew them in this one way or right. 10 years ago or absolutely. And I think we can't, we can't assume that people don't want new friends or new connections. And I think that, that can be really tough when you go, when you, when you move into a small town that um, isn't yours. So I heard, what do you call those? They're not the returners. Transplants. Returners when you go transplants. Transplants. Yep. So yep. Um, that's a I challenge have, for sure. I love that you have names for like the different kinds because it's such a great way to capture it. Um, so for transplants, you might think, oh, well, these people don't, they have their friends. They are, they don't want new friends or new connections. Well, mm, that's, I mean, no, they do. You know, don't assume that. Now there could be some people who are like, no, I'm good, you know, but that's fine. You need to be friends with them. That's fine. Exactly. But when we assume, oh, these people don't want any new connections. You know, one of the things that I found so wonderful about moving into, so I moved into, you know, BJ's hometown community here about three years ago. And um, I, did I post on Facebook or how, how did I, I, I in a, a semi-public way had kind of, Stated, hey, I like one of my goals is to do more, do some things locally or connect with people or something. And it was wonderful because um, within like 48 hours, one of our neighbors had gotten in touch with me and said, hey, like I'm going to, uh, it was like, a, what did we do? It was like a wine and painting type, you know, class or something like that. And so why, like, why didn't you come with me? And I was like, sure, that'd be fun. You know, like, that was great. And I have, you know, since had other women I've met in the community just say, hey, I'm like, I'm having a essential oils party, or I'm having this kind of thing, like, or I'm having a keep collective, you know, party, or I'm doing this. And so I don't even know, but like, come and meet people. And I'm like, okay, great. And then the thing there is that you have to be willing to go to those things, knowing that most everyone else is going to know each other. And you won't. And you have to be like, you just have to be okay with that because you have to go through that a little bit in order to get to the place where you know a few people. And almost, I can't even think of a time where, where it's been otherwise, but you know, most every time I've gone someplace, the host has been like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad you're here. Here, I want you to meet this friend who I think you have this thing in common. And I want you to, I mean, 
I think women do that naturally as well. But mm-hmm. you know, if someone well, and if a woman is hosting, to, if she's hosting, that's right. She probably she has wants, a heart for hosting, right? Yeah, she, absolutely. She's gonna welcome anybody that comes. Yes. You know, she wouldn't invite people into her home if she was gonna be like, "Why are you here?" No, 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 no. It, it so just, I mean, of course, but yeah, you're right. People naturally who are hosting those things enjoy that, but. So I loved going to things like that, even if it was uh, a product or company or thing I wasn't like interested in, but it was like, okay, I'm going to go to this thing to just like meet some ladies who live down the road from me. And those things have been so fun. And some of them have yielded friendships. Some of them have just yielded a feeling of, wow, there's some really neat ladies that live near me. And I don't know if I'll become like super close friends with any of them that I just met today. I don't know. But now, when I see you at the county fair, like, I can chat with you a little bit, and I know how many kids you have, and I know what, you know, who you are, and, and um, I think that I just, I think you have to be willing to be uncomfortable a little bit as you go to some of those things, and then you quickly realize that you're not the only one who's ever moved into the community, like, you know what I mean, well, like, like, God willing, you're, you're not, not the only, you know, like if these, yeah. small, if our small towns are going to succeed, like we have yeah. to figure out how to embrace transplants because we can't just rely on everybody that ever grew up here coming back. Yeah. You know, that's, that's yeah. not, a, that's not a sustainable plan. Yes. So, so, so if, if you are watching and listening and you are someone who really has some good roots in your community already, mm-hmm. and you recognize that someone is a transplant. I ask of you, invite that person to things and intentionally make it a point to say, oh, I wanted to connect you with so-and-so, or I think maybe you'd love to come to this thing. And so if you already have the community, like the community for people who are, are coming into your small town, is so important and, yeah. and will pay you back so fully with both just a feeling of you know, you'll feel good about it, but like that comes back to you as well. Well, and okay. So there's, there's a couple of benefits of having this mindset. Um, one is that personal satisfaction, feeling like you belong, feeling like you have a sense of community, Mm -hmm. you know, feeling like you, you have a place that's, that's so important for just personal fulfillment in life. Relationships are important, but then it's so, it's so interesting because one of the things I hear I hear a lot in the work that I do is about how do we get, okay, so the the word that, the phrase that a gal used with me just the other, it was like last week, she said to me, how do I activate other people? Oh. And this is how we activate other people. It's getting to know other people. So from, I think from a community standpoint, Every committee is going to need volunteers. Every project, every program, every group, yeah. if they're going to sustain and last and be here for the future, you know, you eventually yeah. you need fresh blood. Well, it's not just like, oh, Marlene's new to town. I'm going to ask her to do this, this, and this. Not until I know Marlene. Like, I'm not going to just randomly ask you, like, I'm in five things and we need five volunteers. So new people. Yeah. But that's, that's how new ideas generate. That's how fresh perspectives come into play, but you've got to build relationships first. Oh, yeah. I mean, not to sound cliche, but so much. Yes. Right. Like, no, I love yes, it. Like you have to get to know, you have to get to know people. And, and that starts with like, if you're the person who's already rooted in your small town, then Yes, you, you've got to be intentional. And but does that mean you have to invite people over to dinner every week to your house? Not necessarily, but if that's like something you enjoy, yes, do that. Like, mm-hmm. does no one else in your neighborhood do that, but you would really like to do it, do it anyway, you know, but probably more likely it is, um, someone did this with me in the first year that I lived here. Um, we had gotten to know each other very briefly because we both judged an FSA contest together at the local high school. And uh, a couple months later, she had said, hey, I'm involved in this organization. We meet over lunch, you know, in town. And the speaker today is just really cool. And I think you might enjoy them. And I was like, I'm not going to ask you to do anything, but I just thought like, maybe you'd like to come along. And so I was like, yes, yes, absolutely. And it was great. And I met some cool ladies there. 
And in that case, like that wasn't an organization that I knew would be a fit for the kind of interest I had. Right. But I might have really thought about it because of the cool people that were in it. So anyway, this brings up another point that I think is interesting. And that is sometimes, especially in small towns, if we have any history there or lots of small towns are very similar in the kind of opportunities they provide, we feel like, oh, I know what I'm going to be involved in. So like personally, I might say, okay, I'm going to be involved in Farm Bureau and um, I'm going to be involved in these things because like those, like those are the groups I do. Like those are the things I fit in. And so, oh, there's a women's advocacy group. Well, I, I mean, like, I, I don't know what those are about. Like, I wouldn't do those. Like, those aren't my thing or what, whatnot. But I don't really know what those groups are like. So why am I crossing them off the list? And so I think if you really want to get involved, you really do need to look at, like, what are all of the different kind of places and organizations I could plug in? Look at the people who are there right. because there's some really cool people. And sometimes you find yourself fitting into an organization because of who the other people are, um, not necessarily because the strongest motivator is the, is the, what the thing of the it's group the is. Work. And right. yeah. Right. So, you know, don't yet, let yourself to just like the things you've always done. It's what's so fun. I need to take <laughs> me, well, me too. And what's so fun about this is so, um, so in the survival kit, which is the opt-in mm -hmm. on my website, right? So there's for transplants, returners, yeah. and stayers. One yeah. of the things in there is... Wait, wait, tell me, tell me the things again. There's returner, stayers, returners, transplants. And that's it. Just the three. Oh, the three. Like, the three. Yep. Right. Okay. Those are the three, the three ways yeah. that we find ourselves yeah. in small towns, right? So one of the things that's in there is, you know, as, as a tool or a resource is these yeah. monthly wallpapers that I, that I create. And I... I just create, cause tomorrow's March 1st. So March's wallpaper will go yeah. out in an email today. Okay. So in this seriously, it is all about expansion. It's all about expansion. It fits perfectly into what we're talking about. Like we, I expand my life by expanding both my heart and my mind. Right. And I, we expand yeah. our minds by interacting with and engaging with people that hold opposing viewpoints. Mm hmm so making sure, so uh, on Monday, um, Monday's episode is going to be my friend Cassidy. And we're talk, we were talking about echo chambers and how, yeah. how important it is. So like what you just said is it's so easy to say, but these are my, these are my things. These are, these are my people. And this is where I, do, like you said, these are my groups. But instead to just say, okay, what if you just visit <laughs> another right. Or visit another committee and see what the work's about. And that's, again, like living big in a small town is about just looking for ways to expand. And you don't have to be in yeah. a huge community for that to happen. Because usually there's lots of cool right. things going on in small towns. But it is, it is yes. getting out of our own way. Yes. It, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it's thinking about, um, I just, I love, I love that term expansion. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled you're calling it that. Um, and like, so for you, I think I know some of the answer to this because by the way, I loved your book. Oh, um, you. But like for you, what, what does that look like for you? Cause you're a returner. Like that's the late, that's the group you would fall into, right? You're a returner. And so like for you, how did that, how did that work for you when you came back in, in order to like, look at what are different ways that maybe are outside of what I thought I would fit into, like that you went ahead and pursued. I didn't ask yeah. that well, but. Yeah, no, 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 you're good. I, so it's exactly what you touched on before that I needed to be very mindful of the prejudgments I had in my mind. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. So to give you like an example, so I kind of told you, you know, so Hannah's parents were my lamas. That, that was, I'm not kidding. That was one of those experiences where, I, I grew to truly love them as people, not as Hannah's yeah. parents, but as individual people and what they gave to us, the gift they gave to us, like natural, I, I naturally delivered my three children because of these, these people and their commitment to, to me and my family. It was, they're beautiful people. Wait, does that mean that you had no drugs at all? That means I had no drugs at all. Okay. I have not experienced childbirth, but. Wow. It's something. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Let me say, it's something. And, I, and, that's, and that's not at all like a, I mean, the women that choose epidurals, like, do your yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, for sure, it, for sure. There's, but I, for whatever reason, 
I was like, I want to do this. And it was not just Sharon, but it was Tom as well. And how Tom supported my husband. It was just yeah. so cool. So that experience, and that was within my first year of, of living here. Um, definitely. It just, it, it was a fundamental shift in my heart. Like, I don't know these people. I think I know these people. It's not the same. Yeah. So then um, another like yeah. quick little story. Um, my, uh, like a long-term boyfriend from high school, his mother, and then one of my mom's friends, like that's how I viewed these women, right? Yeah. Ex boyfriend, yeah. mom, and my mom's friend. They were in this club and they asked me if I would consider joining it and they took me out to coffee. It was such a beautiful, I didn't, I didn't, again, sim, similar to you, I didn't end up joining that committee. At least it wasn't the yeah. right time, but I got to see their passion for what it was that they were doing. And again, it shifted yeah. and expanded my viewpoint of these two particular women. Yeah. And that's, I think that's what we have to do. If you're a returner in particular, yeah. it's, yeah. it is the, you, you don't know everything about people. And again, mm -hmm. I am not like now I'm just friends with everybody. No, I'm not because friendship. So like the inner circle, the nest yeah. is something yeah. I protect. And I, I take that very seriously, but man, do it. Does it not, did it not change the way I think about people? Like plugging people into different things and knowing what people's gifts are, I think is such a cool thing to experience. Right. right. So and we just, for, and for me, that's been a huge deal. It's just to get over and myself. If you're a returner, you just sort of assume, oh, everyone's going to treat me like a kid still. Yeah. Well, there, there may, there may be a transition period. I haven't lived in my hometown as an adult, so I don't know what that would be like. And I recognize that now it's been a good 15 years since I lived there. So if I moved back, I'm sure it would be different than if I had moved back very soon. Mm -hmm. But I, I would guess that even if there is kind of a transition period, if you show up in a way that you know, you're not, you're not um, interacting with, with folks as if you're still a kid in their life that mm -hmm. over time, like that changes and maybe it does take a little bit, but it takes time, um, I think. But for me, yeah. it was like releasing the smugness. So I came back oh, with, with yes. like a little bit of self-righteousness, to be honest, it's not pretty, but yeah. it's true. like, I've lived people. Yeah. <laughs> like, I've been away and I've lived and I can lend so much value to your groups. I mean, I didn't, it wasn't quite that overt, but we need to, we just need to remember that it doesn't give us the right to be or do anything. No. Like we still need no. to sit back and learn and ask questions. So I think really yeah. the goal here to me, it's curiosity. I mean, if you can always keep yes. a curious mind and heart, um, you're going to ask good questions. You're going to find out great information but it's whenever we think we already know. That's what gets yes. us in trouble. Yes. And, and if, if, it, if you are, well, this is a little bit, this is a little bit on a different note, but I was thinking of this because just the other day, so I'm on, um, I, I am on our, our county's Farm Bureau board. And so I'm helping to plan a farm tour that's gonna happen this fall. And so our little committee had um, identified some folks in the area that we thought might make good stops. Generally speaking, I never know who they're talking about because I just don't know. I, like, like the other people on my committee are native to the community and they know everyone and everyone knows them, which is great. So anyway, I had to call someone the other day to talk to them about, hey, would you be interested? Would you consider this? I've got a lot. Of, I've got some information I can share with you. And um, I shared with them my last name and I knew where they lived. Like I had made sure I knew who I was, who I was calling, even though I had never met them. And I said, I just live like five miles east of you or so. And, you know, it was fun. And so it was a older gentleman. And he said, now, uh, how did he say it? It was very respectful and like super nice. And he said, now, I used to show hogs with Clifford Ike. How are you? And I, I said, yes, Clifford was my husband's grandfather. So, you know, and in the past, I might have. I might have been bothered by comments like that, not because I cared about being connected to BJ's grandpa, who, uh, you know, I'd never had the chance to meet, but I might have been bothered because it was like, oh, I, I want to be me. Like, I don't want to be Clifford Ike's grandson's wife or whatever. But that's not what this gentleman was trying to do at all. He was just, I mean, that's, it's what we naturally do is to go, wait, I know that name. 
yeah. are you connected to these folks? They're just trying to kind of figure out like, where do you fit in and learn some things about you? And so and anyway, I had thought of that because it goes back to like a smugness piece maybe of like, yes. of thinking, well, sure, that might be my last name, but I want to make my own identity. Well, why, like, why would I, why what should I feel like I need to have my own identity. People are just trying to figure out how you fit into everything and right. how you're connected to the people they know. And that's rarely a bad thing, you know? <laughs> well, totally. And I, I mean, I can absolutely relate to that. I mean, I'm, it's my husband farms now. So it's like, I'm, even yeah. though I'm originally from here, sometimes I'm like, I'm his wife or yeah. for sure, I'm my parents' daughter. I mean, they, they live right. across the street from me, Marlene. Like, this isn't, it's not something I can escape. But I think, yeah. I think we always have to question, defensiveness usually is a sign of something deeper, right? And I, I have a defensive, yeah. like I said, a little self-righteousness, and I get a little feisty about things. But then I have to take a step back and say, okay, what, what's really my problem? And is this really a bad thing or am I making it a bad thing? It's not a bad thing, yeah. right? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, it's a lot of growth. Unfortunately, like it takes, we have to dig deep sometimes with some of these things. Yeah. It's not, that's why I'm so, I'm so thrilled when you said, let's talk about this because I think a lot of the advice is trite for, cause it's so much trickier than that. Like in a small town, yeah. you know, again, like you're, you're woven together with everybody like this. Um, right. I don't just get to write you off and I don't just get to leave because it's hard. <laughs> you know, there's gotta be more, more to it. So how do we dig deep in and find those things? So this is such a beautiful, well, and it's, beautifully timed conversation. And it's the willingness to look deep and, and know that that's how it goes because you're right. You, if you, if there is um, some kind of unfortunate situation with someone, you're still going to see them in the grocery store or they still sit three pews in front of you at church, or they, you know, and, you know, speaking of church, it should be a lesson to us that especially in small towns, we need to practice Christ's love all the time, <laughs> like, because it's right in front of us. And in bigger areas, maybe you get away with, ah, I don't really feel like doing that today. And it, and it doesn't, and you're not going to have to deal with it. So you kind of get away with not dealing with, with not resolving certain things. In small right. towns, it's really hard to just, not deal with stuff because you're still going to be faced with it. And so, um, especially in small communities, like we have to remember to just, so look at ourselves, really dig deep and go, if I'm feeling defensive or I'm feeling negatively about the situation, what's going on with me that's mm -hmm. making me feel that way? Because the chances are that it's someone else. It's probably, it's probably coming from some, I, I should tilt my camera down. It's probably coming, you know, from something here. Right. And, and we've got to be willing to look at what that is um, and then just flat out be willing to love other people. And, and small towns require us to do that so much more, but it's also one of the beautiful things about living in a small town I because totally if you live in a small town and, and you've got something that's going on in your life, people were, people are going to show up for you. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you've got a responsibility, I think, to show up for other people. Agreed. But, and I think that's one of the things I've always loved about my own small town is that especially with, you know, like my family history, I feel such a sense of place there. As mm -hmm. if, if I even drive up and down the roads, I may not know who lives in all the houses now, but I know that that's the house my great grandpa grew up in. And then so-and-so lived there. And my grandparents used to drive down this road and my dad farms that field over there. And Jim mm -hmm. farms that one there. And, you know, like there's a sense of place about that. And, I recognize that for me to feel that sense of place here, it's going to take time and recognize it's going to take time, but I've got to be really intentional about doing that. And I shouldn't wait for people to always ask me. I should be grateful when people do ask me mm -hmm. to participate and be willing to do that. But I've also got to be willing to make the effort myself because they might be sitting on the other side of that, you know, situation going, well, I don't want to ask her to do things like I don't want her to think I'm pushy. And so I'm going to wait for her to show interest, mm -hmm. you know, and, yeah. and, and so everybody we've got to be just intentional. sits around waiting for somebody yes. to make the first move, yes. right? Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah so good. Um, okay. So, so I love this conversation so much, but I don't want to neglect to get into. Yes. Okay. Good. I'm, I the other, the other aspect of this, yeah. which is about forging and creating and nurturing and fostering 
engagement and real relationships via social media and or the yeah. interwebs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so because that's another think, huge thing for people, yeah. right? In small communities, like yeah. So there's just you know the other thing about a small community is that if you because of the technology we have available today, you might work remotely for a company and live in your small town. You might have your own kind of business. Um, and, and, and anyway, there, because of the way technology works, there is a decent chance that you might do a certain kind of work. You might live in your community, but do a certain kind of work that nobody else in your community is really going to understand. Uh -huh. um, and yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. I mean, for yeah. sure. People are like, so you're like, I, you okay. Yeah. Oh gosh, Marlene, we could talk for, it's so funny. Yeah. The comments people make, you know, and then that's where, again, my defensiveness, if I, yeah. it's on a bad day, I'm like, oh, you just don't yeah. know. But, that's right. Well, and again, the defensiveness, like I have found that generally people do care and want to, like they care and want to know and be supportive of what I do, but they might not get it. They just don't like, get it. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. And, um, and that's okay. Or if you work for a company and have a very niche job that you get to work at it from home for, and you live in your small town, there's probably a chance that I'm not going to get what you do either, right? So it's, again, looking inside, making sure we're not getting defensive about that. So I think there's a lot of, lot of ways that we might feel isolated in certain things. Um, and because, again, we live in the society we do today, we've got a lot of good opportunities to connect with people who do get what we do and find some of that support that we might need in a very specialized kind of way, because I think we do need community in all aspects of our life. And so I do too. We, we do have to have community with folks to kind of get our work. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think some of that can be done online. I do think some of that can be done in person, but we've got to be willing to look beyond just our small town and be willing to go to where that might be. You know, one of the things um, before we talk specifically about social media is that, you know, we live roughly, roughly 90 minutes from Columbus, Ohio, which is the biggest city in Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, we also live about 90 minutes from Cleveland, which is obviously a big city as well. So we're kind of smack dab in the middle. Columbus has always been like my city because I went to Ohio State and OSU is in Columbus. Mm -hmm. And we lived near Columbus. I worked at OSU then, like I have friends there. I don't have a connection to Cleveland at all. So even though like we're definitely in the middle, I always am driving towards Columbus and hardly ever towards Cleveland. And I, you know, just, I know that probably if you might laugh because I know you like, I forget how far you are from a target or a Walmart, but um, like, I just, I know that like a lot of weeks I'm going to make a trip to Columbus, like once a week, sometimes twice a week, sometimes a few weeks will go by where I don't go to Columbus at all. But um, just to make it, a, just to sort of build that into like my schedule, my routines, my expectations about how my life is going to work that, yeah, like I'm going to drive to Columbus once or maybe twice a week, usually once. Um, and so a couple days ago, I really, I had really wanted to have lunch with someone and I wanted to have lunch in person rather than just have a phone call. And so I drove to Columbus just to have lunch with someone. And so again, you might laugh because you're like, yes, I have to drive 90 minutes all the time like to even get to anything. I do, um, and I, but I get this. So, okay, yeah. so you had lunch. So, so, yeah, and so like, you know, you might look at that and go, gosh, like I spent four and a half hours or whatever, like driving and coming back and having the lunch. But that, but, but that was important because some of those connections are so much stronger when you can do some things face to face rather than over the phone or over conference call. And so um, I think something that has been incredibly beneficial to me in a professional sense is for me to look beyond just my town and say, who are the people? And for me specifically, who are the women in their twenties to thirties to forties that I, who do work similar to me that I really want to forge a very strong professional connection with um, and quite frankly, a friendship with, who can, we can support each other. Um, and how am I just going to make that happen so that we see each other in person? And, you know, actually what that led to was that a couple years ago, um, another friend of mine who again does kind of work similar, works from home, you know, is isolated in a professional sense, super involved though in her local community. We created a mastermind group just for ourselves and set and invited some women to join us in that. And we're going to, you know, here, we're, here are the expectations. We're going to get together for, for three days, once a year in person. We intentionally didn't like invite women from all kinds of other states. Like we just kind of stuck to Ohio and Indiana and Michigan so that we could be 
we couldn't geographically drive together. Um, and so, you know, the gal that I met for lunch a couple of days ago, she's one of the women who's in that group. And mm -hmm. I, again, so this just goes back to, yes, there's all kinds of ways to connect with people online. And I think there's a lot of things there we can talk about, but also if you want to, if you want to connect with people, what are you willing to do in order to make that happen? And so like, for me, that's just knowing I'm going to drive to Columbus once a week for things. And so right. And sometimes for things that, yes, I could do over a video conference, but in person, it, it strengthens that connection. So, so that was a soapbox, but. No, 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 no. You're good. It, this, yeah. this is beautiful because there's, there's, another, there's another aspect of this I want to ask you if you've yeah. ever felt or experienced. So having moved from Fargo to my small town, so now I'm 110 miles from Fargo, yeah. all of my professional connections were there. So it's kind of funny you say like I go here instead of there. I totally have that in my life too. Like there, like yeah. Bismarck is the capital of North Dakota. I yeah, I don't ever drive to Bismarck unless there's like an event or something because I just don't have. Yeah, yeah I don't have people. Right. So yeah. and you don't know where the restaurants are. You don't know what's right. Like. I don't know anything. Like I I like I, have to GPS right. everything, which is silly, <laughs> you know. Um, but one of the things that was a huge, I would say, game changer for me in terms of productivity in my own business. When I first went out on my own, okay, so I, you know, I came back and I worked for other people for five years before it back in, in Oaks in our small town. Anybody who wanted to have coffee with me in, in Fargo, even I would figure out how to schedule them all in. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I was absolutely doing that, but I would say I was doing it without intention. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I guess for the women that are listening, I also want to be sure yeah. we are being good stewards of that travel time. Like you are being smart and you are being strategic. The, the women that you're talking about, it's, there is a clear, and again, it's so hard because locally it's all about relationships. Like I have no idea how this is going to benefit me and it doesn't matter. I just want to have a knowledge and a, and, and know right. who people are. But for me professionally, I've, I've actually had to be much more um, discerning about who gets those coffee dates and lunch dates yes. with me and who doesn't. Yes. Have you experienced that ever? A time where maybe oh, I think, you overdid yeah. those for the sake of getting to know people. And then at some point you're like, yeah, what, it, how is this furthering my business and how is this strategic? Yes. Have you ever experienced well, that? Well, for sure. And I think for me it was learning. Um, it was learning to be able to know the difference between, is this going to be an interaction that furthers our relationship or is this an interaction about getting some task related things done? Mm -hmm. And if it's one that builds a relationship, then I'm going to really consider um, making the space for it in my schedule to travel to them and do that. Um, and what I've done, I've really, I think again, from a very tangible logistical thing, there is, um, so we live on the, we live north of Columbus and I-270 is the outer belt that goes, you know, or the interstate that goes around Columbus and just outside 270 on the north side of town is a major exit called Polaris Parkway. It would be like the Jordan Creek of Des Moines. It would be the, um, I'm trying to think of like another city, right? So it's like a big shopping center area, lots of great restaurants. Um, it only takes me an hour and 10 minutes to get to the Polaris area. And so one thing I've learned when I do make the decision to say, yep, I want to make the time and space to meet with someone. I just request, Hey, can we meet on Polaris Parkway someplace? Because then it's super easy, like for me, and it makes it even easier. So I guess what I would say is first try to really discern the difference between is this relationship building or is this more about getting some tasks done? Because again, technology allows me to get, have great meetings, great conference calls, video conference chats when it's more task related with folks yeah. um, and to just like schedule it in, get it done. Like, like we're doing this here, you know, getting this yeah. um, both from our individual offices. If it's relationship building, then I really think about making space for it. And if I've decided that, um, not necessarily giving all of it, but asking that person to perhaps give a little bit too and say, could you meet me on Polaris yeah. rather than coming all the way downtown? Not that it's that much further, but traffic and other things, it's like super easy. Now, that doesn't always work out. 
like the lunch I had a couple days ago, we met downtown because of the thing, all the things that just worked out. And I said, yeah, like I'm willing to do that. It was going to be in the middle of the day and traffic was going to be fine, you know? Yeah. So it's about, um, and knowing that early in your, if you're earlier in your career, there, there might be, you might be choosing relationship building things more often. And I, I think that's okay. And I think that might be a, a realistic thing you have to think about because now as a 36 year old, I have spent some time building some of those relationships where we can get on a conference call and get things done because we've already built the relationship through in-person things over the years. Yep. And I, I think that's important to recognize because if you're early in your career, you may need to figure out how to do some things in person in order to build the relationship with certain organizations or groups and do more of that early on. Um, and I just, there's just not, there's not a substitute for in-person connections, but my gosh, in-person connections can be complemented so well and followed up on it and continue to be nurtured with all of the things we have online. Initially, we're going to talk about social media now. So now I'm trying right. to circle back to that, right? right. Like, so. Well, it, it, so one other thing on the, on the outside yeah. of your kind of immediate. Yeah. How, what's your take on um, conferences and yeah. workshops and all that kind of stuff? Like, what's your take on that from a, from a relationship building standpoint? Yeah. I used to think like, oh, okay, spending money to go to a conference, is, it's like frivolous spending. Like, I'll do it if I have extra or it'll just be like fun. What I've realized is that, n no, it's not frivolous. Like, I need to budget for this. I need to make it happen. Mm -hmm. um, because it's necessary in order to make the connections. So setting that aside, planning for it, not thinking of it as like vacation money, um, but to really plan for it for my own professional development and for a chance to go do some things in person, because, oh my gosh, the energy that you can get from going to something in person as well is just wonderful. Um, but then also like, if you're going to do that, you, and this would be like a whole other right, show and conversation, but if you go intentionally building connections while you're there. But anyway, in a very short sense, like switching my thinking from this isn't like an extra fun spend. This is something I really ought to be doing and, and need to invest in doing. Yep. And budgeting yep. for it, which I think is really smart. And I yep. just a quick tip yeah. for women that might think like, cause I think it can be tempting to just do the things that are easy to get to. Yeah. And some of those Sometimes, again, it just depends on the fit of the, of the whole thing, but oh, don't sure. do it just to get out of your house. Take the time and research the things that are really going to provide you with the opportunities to meet the people you want to meet. So I think a really great idea for this is if you don't know where those are, that's when you can take to social media and say, hey, friends, yes. these are the kinds of connections I'm hoping to make. These are the kinds of people I'm hoping to get to know. What opportunities are there, you know, and it's just amazing because there are so many things you could do, but a lot of times we're, we're limited. You don't, it's not like social media serves up everything. I mean, for real, you start talking about anything, I swear they're listening. And all of a sudden you're going to see all the stuff for the things that you were just talking about. But I think that's a great way to leverage, you know, your network and say, what's out there yeah. for me, you know, what conferences. Oh, should well, for sure. It's, it's funny you mentioned that. Just yesterday, I posted in a Facebook group that I'm a part of, um, you know, hey, like, folks, I would love to attend a conference about podcasting this year. Um, what do you, what would you recommend if you have been to one? Because I had Googled it and, like, looked at different things, but I really wanted to hear, like, what do you think that is valuable or whatnot? Yeah, um, because, experience is always fun. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, yeah, just like leveraging online. So if we go like that, kind of on this online mm -hmm. route, um, I think social media is this just fantastic opportunity to connect with people outside your geographic community that you would have, you might never have connected with before. We would never have connected if it weren't for social media or it would have taken a long time yep. uh, and the right conference, right? For us to finally meet. So I love that. Um, there's a good chance, to, but, but, when you have to have forged a relationship in person through some in-person experience with somebody, social media allows you to continue that relationship mm -hmm. um, in a really wonderful way. So like that mastermind group that I'm now a part of uh, for myself, 
you know, we, we met in person and we continued to meet in person a couple times a year, um, one for kind of overnight longer time. And then we've met like on the other half of the year for just like a one day. Um, but then every month we have a Google hangout like a really intentional time that anybody who can get on, we get on, we have a conversation about things. We also have a private Facebook group where there's always just like little threads of stuff going that people need help with. There's only like 10 of us like in this group. So it's, it's close. Um, but the reason we're able to have a really good conversations on Google hangout or a really good conversation in a Facebook group is because we first forged a relationship in person. And I think for us, that was really, really key. And so again, how are you going to build a relationship with a person? It might take scheduling time to go to conferences. It might mean building into like your expectations and your routines that you're going to travel to certain meetings or meeting meetups or be willing to go and have coffee or lunch with somebody again in a really intentional way. Mm -hmm. um, but then knowing that, man, we have, we just have all this at our fingertips. Like I just, I do think to myself, wow, if I, if, if we were just 20 years ago, 1999, I mean, we had AOL Instant Messenger. We had email and AOL Instant Messenger. I we didn't even carry a cell phone. No, I was in high school. <laughs> I, 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 would gra I graduated in 1999. Yeah. So it's my 20-year yeah. reunion this year. But we didn't carry cell phones. No, no. No one did. No. So it's, I, it's in crazy. Let's like you said, just 20 years ago, it's crazy. What yeah. It and so, you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And so like, I just, it, it's a totally different thing. And so sometimes when I go, sometimes when I find myself going, Oh, but I wish I lived closer to these people or these people, I go, wow, I need to have a reality check and remember to be incredibly grateful for the opportunity to both live in a, it's like the best of both worlds live in a small yeah. town in this rural area. There's some wonderful people that live 10 minutes and five minutes and 15 minutes from me. And the town of Worcester is a cool town. If you're ever in Northeast Ohio, you should come to Worcester. I'm going to come and visit you. I am. It's on I would love to. <clears throat> yes. It's on the it's bucket great. list. It's happening. <laughs> and I mean, it's a cool town and there's cool things that happen there. But also, I can drive to a big city or travel to a big city when I want. It's not a big deal for me to, I mean, I have to plan and budget for it. But like, right. it's not, it's not a huge deal for me as a woman to buy a plane ticket and travel by myself to a conference on the other side of the country if I wanted to. 50 years ago, I, you might not have done that as, as, as quickly. Mm -hmm. um, maybe 50 is not the right, that would have been what, 69, 70. So, you know, my years might be off. But um, and I can make all these connections online with people and keep, keep in touch with people that I have met. I mean, you know, if you, if I were, if I were more funny, I'd be like, what a time to be alive. But it's, it is kind of like that, isn't it? What a time to be alive. It's amazing. It's you live amazing. in freaking Oaks, North Dakota, and I'm, we're chatting, uh, for your show. Like, yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's and that's, that's just it. It's that I, yeah. I want, I really want women to understand and hear, hear us, like really hear yes. us and, and put it in their hearts and, and believe that there's so many opportunities. And I think getting back to really the core of the message today, it's that face-to-face -face relationships are very, very important. And you're, we're probably all missing cool connections right in our own backyards. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You just, you just have to, I mean, this might sound harsh, but you just kind of like got to get over yourself, mm -hmm. put yourself out there, stop making some of those assumptions. So, you know, I'm a very action oriented person. So if you're listening and you want to make more connections, I mean, I would just really ask yourself today, like, what's a group that I've never thought about joining? Cause I thought, oh, that's not for me. Or I don't know those people. Um, but what's a group in your town that you could go check out because they have a monthly lunch or they have a thing, or you happen to know somebody that goes and you, you could just reach out and say, Hey, I just always wonder, could I tag along with you if you don't want to show up by yourself? Um, there's always things pub like posted publicly about events that are going on. Mm -hmm. Show up, even if you just sit in the back of the room and watch the first right. time, right. And see what right. it's about. So. 
I would just, if you if you want to make more connections, um, move past some assumptions that maybe you have and just like think of one thing that you could check out in your town. Worst thing that would ever happen in that scenario is that you go and you realize, oh, that's not for me. And you come home mm -hmm. and you try it again next month with a different group. Exactly. That's yeah. a beautiful, beautiful way to end this discussion, extending a little challenge to everybody that's watching. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. Thank you so much for being here, Marlene. It was a yeah. beautiful conversation and I mean it. Now you have to come back. Oh, I would love to. I can't wait to. If there's one thing I hear from women more than anything else that are living in small towns, it's that sometimes we can just feel downright lonely. So grab your copy of the Small Town Survival Kit where you will find a couple of options for people to connect with and ways to feel not so isolated because I promise you, sister, you're really not alone in this. Thank you.